Hi, everyone. So this is a joint work with uh, Nicoletta Battini at the Riksbank. Um, of course, the usual disclaimers apply. Uh, the views are ours. They do not necessarily reflect those of our uh, respective institutions. Um, so in terms of policy relevance, we have uh, we live in a world uh, characterized by uh, you know, r rapid decline in biodiversity. Um, and this is a problem for the environment. It's also a problem for us as a society since we rely on the ecosystem services that are derived, that derives from, from the stock of nature. And, and so this begs the question on how to try to you know, integrate uh, uh, nature, uh, which we are going to call natural capital or KN, uh, into fairly standard you know, macroeconomic models um, and what are the implications of doing so uh, and also trying to understand the role of green policies in terms of welfare. So this is a project which uh, has a first go uh, in this direction. Uh, briefly, uh, traditional grow models, uh, starting from the solo model, don't have an, you know, a role for, for the material foundations of production, of course, over the years. Uh, things have changed, uh, you know, large energy shocks, uh, rising pollution have, gave, uh, have increased the interest of our model that tries to, 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 to understand the role of energy and renewable and non-renewable resources. As of today, there is a very interesting literature that looks actually at the political economy aspects of how to manage uh, natural resources. Uh, and on the policy arena, more recently, the, uh, the Gupta prepared a report for the UK government where it was uh, you know, made uh, pretty clear uh, the, the importance of accounting for, for, for natural capital, both as a stock you know, uh, needed uh, for, uh, for, for, for society, uh, but also as a, as a, as a stock producing uh, flows which generate ecosystem services. So in this uh, work, we are, our contributions are to model uh, this variable KN as a bounded factor input in the supply side of a macro model. And we want to link its value not only to its exploitation, but also to its uh, economic value when conserved. And then we want to derive some green policies. And we, want to, we are going to show uh, that when an economy starts with a large endowment of natural assets, it's optimal to deplete some, but to conserve some. And of course, if the dynamics of nature are characterized by some tipping point, uh, you know, the conservation should be higher. Um, and in particular, if a tipping point exists in the dynamics of nature, it's optimal uh, from a you know, social planner standpoint to initially lower uh, the level of output consumption macroeconomic variables, which will then allow for having a stronger uh, a sustainable grow. And then we are going to do a simple, fairly simple exercise in which we assume that nature can have some TFP externalities and we are going to see how this affects welfare. Um, I won't go into the equations of the model uh, apart from the, the one uh, describing natural capital. So this is just to give an overview of the fairly simple model we have in mind. There are two blocks on the right hand side. There is the foreign block uh, where you have households and then a final consumption good firm, which we call the F firm, which is using uh, both capital and foreign labor together with an intermediate input. This intermediate input is in turn an aggregate of two inputs, which we call green and brown uh, inputs, which are not produced by the foreign economy. And then we have on the, uh, on the left the home economy, which is uh, uh, to some extent symmetric to the foreign economy with households uh, and, and consumption good firm, which are called the YH. Uh, and these firms are, again, using an in aggregate intermediate input. The difference is that now the home economy has also an endowment of uh, uh, of nature, which is, uh, appears here in the green triangle, and this endowment of nature uh, functions as an input in the production of, uh, of green and brown technologies, uh, which, uh, which are essentially producing the intermediate goods which are uh, also exported to the foreign economy. We are going to you know, simplify the macro side, so we are going to assume complete markets, uh, full labor mobility within a block, um, and no own bias in consumption. So I will just describe the natural capital and the brown production and green production structures. By brown production, we, what we actually mean is uh, any uh, you know, technical process that uses the stock of nature as an input and in a, does so in an unsustainable way, meaning that 
it affects negatively the way in which nature accumulates. The green production can be seen as having two interpretations. The first one is, again, any technical process that relies on the stock of nature, but it does so in a, in a sustainable way, meaning that when we look at nature intertemporally from one period to the next, we shouldn't see any impact of this type of production on the rate at which nature accumulates. And the other interpretation is, uh, perhaps more direct, is, is that of uh, you know, environmental offsets, which are uh, quite in vogue nowadays. So this is uh, the equation we have when we think about the stock of nature evolution, which is uh, uh, you know, quite standard in, in, in the environmental uh, literature. Uh, the evolution of nature is going to depend on K and B and K and G, so the exploited and conserved amount of nature, and then on three exogenous common and fixed parameter, RN, CC, and CT, and RN is what we call the intrinsic regeneration rate, which is essentially drives the accumulation process. CC is a carrying capacity level, which is an upper uh, limit toward which nature converges if, uh, uh, if it accumulates sustainably. And then uh, NCT is what is also commonly referred as a tipping point. We are going to focus on two specifications which are quite extreme in their characterization. They are, however, uh, useful for us uh, to uh, you know, describe a, a range of possibilities and to distill some properties that we want to highlight. The first specification doesn't assume actually that there is a tipping point, and so we will have this uh, logistic uh, you know, function which is going to depend only on the carrying capacity and the amount of uh, exploited nature uh, uh, every period. And we are going to call AN the accumulation rate. The other specification is the opposite. Uh, and now we introduce a, a critical threshold. The critical threshold is such that once KN falls below this level, uh, the accumulation rate essentially turns negative and the stock of nature converges to zero. So it's, of course, extreme. Again, uh, it's less common. It's the specification emphasized by Das Gupta, and we think it's useful to think about these th themes. Uh, graphically speaking, these are the accumulation rates into two specifications. The dashed one is the model without critical threshold. It's always positive. It has a peak. Uh, around 0 0.5, and the other one is the accumulation rate with a critical threshold. Of, we are going to focus, of course, on the region which is above the critical threshold, which, of course, is restricted, and here it starts at 0 0.7, which is the value we are selecting. And, you know, changing, uh, changing the parameters uh, is going to affect this accumulation rate. Here I'm increasing the critical threshold to show you uh, how this restricts the region where, which is sustainable. And also, the intrinsic generation rate is going to you know, pull up the uh, accumulation. Because uh, it's, uh, it's hard to understand and to quantify how much uh, you know, nature regenerates through time, we're also allowing for some uh, shock, which is, uh, which is going to uh, affect uh, the, the extent of regeneration. Our main analysis is going to focus on a social planner type of pro uh, problem, so very, very standard. Um, uh, is social planner in maximizing global welfare of, of the home and foreign economy. Uh, we are going to assume standard utility functions, and this is essentially the resource constraints uh, that the social planner is facing. The first four on the left-hand side is essentially are the output, or you can see the output of four and on consumption, and brown and green goods, and then on the right-hand side, you have the users of this output. And the last two equations are simply the equation that I just described about nature. Here, kappa is a, is a cost function, which is going to increase the, the amount of exploited nature, and that's, uh, we, we follow the environmental literature on that. Uh, the only first order condition I want to mention is the one associated with uh, uh, the amount of conserved nature, which, of course, gives rise to a shadow price uh, which is going to be determined by a wedge between the you know, marginal cost uh, in conserving more nature, which of course cannot be used for the production of the brown inputs, and uh, the marginal benefit in, con in conserving more nature, which is going uh, to be, uh, you know, which is going to translate in more production of the green goods. 
And of course, we also have an intertemporal condition, which is going to characterize the you know, accumulation or the accumulation of the stock of nature. This mimics the traditional Euler uh, condition in macro model. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the expected benefits of having a larger stock of nature. The difference is that now the first term on the right hand side is also going to take into account the way in which changing nature today is going to affect the accumulation rate of nature itself tomorrow. The second term is simply the impact on uh, higher the stock of nature on brown production. So in terms of calibration, uh, we are going to assume that you know, one period corresponds uh, to five years. Uh, this is in line with the macro, macro literature, um, uh, with the, sorry, with the climate, climate macro lit literature. And uh, we are going to try to align uh, parameter values with, what's, with what we found in prior empirical uh, lead, the lead evidence. Um, and for the nature side, we, we have to experiment uh, because we have a model which is uh, you know, quite parsimonious and there are no uh, clear also at the same time priors on how, on how to uh, you know, connect uh, our model to, 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 to you know, the growing and perhaps not yet available evidence on these dynamics. Uh, and so overall, we should think of this as a, as a numerical exploration, which still tries to, <laughs> um, to be close to, to reality. Uh, yet, I want to just emphasize two parameters for the macro size, which are important. The first one is the uh, intertemporal acidity of substitution that we assume between the green and the brown input, we are going to assume a uh, substitution above one. Uh, it's, it's in the range of what the literature of, of, has found. There is a large variety. Um, but we want to uh, allow for some substitution. And the second one is the shares in the, in the specification of the aggregate intermediate input, which has a CES uh, specific functional form. And here we are going to take the stand that the green uh, share is, uh, is, is low. And we do that because we want to reflect our current economic structures, uh, which are, uh, as of today, heavily reliant on you know, production systems which affect nature. Uh, to set uh, the critical threshold and the carrying capacity, uh, we are going to look at some studies. Uh, there is variety here. Some agreements suggest that, uh, you know, uh, Reducing an original stock of nature below a 70% of its uh, initial mass may have uh, permanent impacts, and that's the value we set. And for the intrinsic regeneration rate, we are going to uh, look at some studies on, on forests and how they have uh, regenerated through time. So we are going to you know, set it in such a way that our dynamics of natural capital in both specifications is consistent with the timing that was observed in these studies about forests. Okay, uh, in terms of model dynamics, uh, we want to study essentially uh, how would a social planner efficiently manage the stock of nature uh, when the economy starts with different endowments uh, or different state, value of the state variable of nature, and we are going to look at four scenarios. Um, in the first one, uh, we assume that uh, the, the world starts with initially abandoned uh, stock of nature, and then the third and the fourth scenario, we are going to look at the case where nature is critically depleted, meaning close to a, carry, a, a critical threshold value. Um, and then after that, so up to now, we are not going to look at the FP, then we are going to compare our results with, uh, with a simple exercise when we, where we have actually an exogenous TFP grow. So uh, before looking at the dynamics, let me just point out the, what, how the economy look like at T0 when they start, because they are depending on whether we assume a critical treasure or not, because of course they are going to be uh, radically different, and this is going to help in, uh, uh, in uh, also analyzing and understanding the dynamics later on. Particularly, having a critical threshold uh, uh, generates an equi equilibrium values which are uh, significantly more compressed. Um, you can see it on, on consumption and, and output in general, with the exception of the, of the green production and, and the labor which is allocated to the green production. Now, 
In terms of model dynamics of uh, nature, so this is a standard figure I will show several times under different contexts. Uh, the top, top left and top right show the stock of nature and the accumulation rates, and then on the, at the bottom the, we have the exploited nature and conserved nature. So what, what we see is that starting with a high level of nature, it's not optimal to keep that high level of nature intact. Well, that's because some of it needs to be used for, for brown production, and the trade-off is particularly stark when you, when you, when you are originally allocating uh, much of it to, uh, uh, to conservation and when you have a high sto uh, stock of nature. Um, and so what we see is that essentially the economy uh, or the stock of nature uh, eventually converges to, to lower levels, which are going to be different. The solid line here refers to the case with a critical threshold, and so it, the economy is essentially going to converge to a higher level of nature. In terms of macrodynamics, uh, we see that the, there is a smooth decline in brown production as the economy readjusts, physical investment also decline. And we generate, the model generates some kind of bump in consumption initially because the way in which physical uh, disinvestment happen uh, compared to our output declines. And uh, importantly, when there is a critical threshold, actually there is no decline in, in green output. Uh, and this is possible because actually the economy is, uh, is moving toward an equilibrium where there is uh, a larger uh, amount of labor. And this figure, let me, I didn't, I forgot to mention they, they show uh, the level of the variable throw times compared to time zero in percentage terms. So we use this uh, kind of apparatus to understand where the economies are evolving in, in percentage terms. Uh, and then we want to move to the critical, uh, critically, critically depleted initial stock of nature. Again, before the dynamics, let's look at, at T0, how this economy compare uh, when the um, the economy has initially a uh, lower stock of nature. Uh, of course, macro variables are more compressed. And here, again, when we have the critical threshold, uh, we see higher, higher uh, levels in, uh, in, in green output and green labor. Now, this figure mimics the one I showed before. Uh, for the dashed lines, which is the case without critical threshold, the dynamics remain coherent with what I've shown. When there is a critical threshold, now we see a different, different uh, you know, different direction. Now there is, it is optimal actually to accumulate nature. Uh, the accumulation rate of nature in this case is going to be pretty low uh, compared to the, uh, you know, to the dash, uh, dash line case. And that's because when we are close to the critical threshold, the ability of nature to uh, recuperate itself is compromised. And so this is, it's going to take time for the economy to go back. But what's important is that as the economy moves toward a state with higher nature, the accumulation rate also is going up. And so this creates a kind of virtual cycle where it's possible to end up in an equilibrium where both um, conserved capital and exploited capital can increase. And that's the bottom lines, uh, the black bottom lines of the figure. And then in, macro, in terms of macrodynamics, uh, well, the dashed line, they're going to, to, to reflect the dynamics that are shown in the abundant case, that is the model without critical threshold. But now in the case where we have uh, a critical threshold, we can see that uh, brown output can expand um, uh, while green output declines as the economy moves away from the critical threshold. And this happens because we'll, uh, with Cayenne, close to its critical threshold. Initially, it is optimal to allocate a lot of resources to the green sector. This is costly given our current economic structure where you know, much, much of production passes through brown, brown, brown system of extractions. And so as the economy moves away uh, from, from the dangerous uh, you know, equilibrium, uh, there, is a, there is a decline in, in, in green output. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and, and that's, that's the main message of this slide. Uh, next, we try to play with the model and, you know, say what happens if we have some exogenous TFE pro process and we are going to follow uh, here some you know, TFE specification in, from, from a paper from Baraj and Ordaus and calibrate it. Uh, and we are going to assume that after 15 periods, the economy reaches a steady growth rate. The figure shows that. And then from period 20, essentially, we are going to assume a stationary solution, uh, which we re re revert to a naive approach where policy functions essentially are stationary. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the slide. Again, the color coding is the same. The gray lines show the, the, you know, the, the comparison with the, with the case without growth. We are going to focus on the relevant scenario where we have critically depleted nature. Um, and the main message here is that, of course, the, the having a higher technological growth increases the right-hand side of the hoteling equation. So it increases the marginal value of stock of nature. And so Inter optimally, uh, for the social planner, it makes sense to uh, you know, increase the shadow price, the mu t today, and so this, this translates in the end in, uh, uh, in, uh, in slower accumulation uh, of nature, which uh, appears in black lines on top, or more rapid accumulation of nature when we look at the dashed line uh, on, 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 on top. And so in terms of dynamic, we look also at grow rates. Here it's grow rate T to T, time to time, period by period. Uh, they remain pretty coherent with the scenario without technological growth. Um, what's in interesting and we want to highlight is the third row where we have uh, the, the case with the black lines that now it's what's happening. Essentially, it is optimal to contain the accumulation of physical capital, is to invest less initially during the first period uh, compared to a scenario without a critical threshold. And in fact, even the current calibration, we see that um, domestic capital accumulates l less on average in the range of minus 4%, uh, minus 4, minus 5% per year over the course of the next 10 years. But eventually, the growth rates pick up, and they actually go above those from the model without critical thresholds. Uh, Okay, so that's, that's the overview I wanted to give, just to, uh, to, to have a sense of, of, the, of how these two models generate very different dynamics, and I, I hope I made the point that it's important to, you know, to, to take into account uh, both of these, uh, of these type of wars to, to, to start to think about uh, nature and its interaction with the economy. Uh, now I want to uh, have, a, again, a pretty simple exercise. Uh, we want to allow uh, for part of TFP, TFP to be driven by the amount of conserved nature. So we kind of uh, split, uh, for instance, AG and AB, which are the TFP, uh, by allowing for some, uh, for some elasticity to, uh, to the stock of conserved nature. And you know, as expected, now when we compare uh, the uh, social plan, planner economy with an economy which is a competitive equilibrium economy where the agents are not internalizing this, we see that there is, you know, it is optimal to accumulate more nature, uh, and in particular in both cases, as it's shown in the uh, top right, there is a kind of front loading in the speed of accumulation or decumulation, depending on the cases, uh, which is happening during the first period, and this is shown by, you know, this non-monotonic -mon -mon uh, evolution of the percentage difference in the accumulation rates. Okay, uh, then we, uh, we study the, the case, uh, I mean, the, we, we study the case of a, of a tax authority uh, in, the, in the home country that establishes a, a lump sum finance subsidy, um, which is offered to the intermediate goods firms uh, on the stock of conserved nature. And uh, we are going to make, make a bit of the, the climate literature, so we, are, we, we could say that it's expressed in, in nominal units. Um, and of course, in our case, the relevant uh, measure is the unit of nature, and you could think of it as, as the stock of forests, stock of fishing populations, and so on. And, and while you can align uh, very directly the social planning solution with that from a competitive equilibrium, but setting a subsidy, which is equal essentially to the uh, marginal value that the conserved nature has on the brown and, and green uh, uh, technologies. And this is what the proposition says. So the, this is what would the, the optimal uh, green subsidy would look like uh, in terms of, of GDP. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's higher during the first period, which is coherent with where you know, most of the actions in terms of dynamics of nature happen, and then it stabilizes uh, over time. Now, uh, it's, it's important to understand that the subsidy, uh, what, what, what the subsidy is doing, of course, is, is generating an equilibrium where there is more conserved nature uh, today uh, or in, in, in the present, and, and this clearly determines a decline in, in consumption compared, uh, compared to a competitive equilibrium without, without a subsidy. 
Uh, eventually, however, this desired stock of nature is going to allow for more production because the economy is able to stabilize at an equilibrium where there is a higher stock, and so both more brown and green productions are possible. And that's what the figure is essentially showing. It's showing the percentage change in, in consumption in an economy with a subsidy and an economy without a subsidy. And, and then, in terms of welfare, we are going to follow the, the term, economic tradition in, in, in computing a kind of welfare equivalent uh, measure uh, of that. And uh, so we are going to assume that all realization of the shocks are set to zero. We are going to assume that the elasticity of output to nature is the same in the brown and the green sector. And so the first stark uh, result that's emerged, which perhaps is unsurprising after I've seen the other, the other slides, is that the welfare gains are, are, are close to zero, essentially, when there is a critical threshold. And I mean, the reason here is that, essentially, uh, there is no much room for manoeuvre for the social planner or for a tax authority uh, because the amount of regeneration of the, the accumulation rate of nature is extremely low and anyway, the economy is already dedicating much, most of uh, its resources to the green sector. Uh, in the other case, which is the case with only a carrying capacity, uh, you know, welfare gains can be substantial depending on the elasticity that is assumed. In our calibration, they go up to 1% of uh, consumption uh, equivalent. Now, uh, we also did another uh, experiment um, and in this experiment, we looked at a global tax on intermediate inputs. So even though uh, a direct subsidy on nature uh, represents a first best uh, policy intervention, uh, and even though there are some cases around the world that go in this direction, it might be less practical than uh, the case of global taxes uh, on, applied on goods that, you know, on trades that uh, already exist. And, uh, um, and this essentially goes in the direction of trying to reduce the amount of brown production. So we set, we set a tax that, such that in equilibrium the relative demand of brown inputs uh, to green inputs reflect the allocation that arises under a social planner. And uh, however, with this tax, essentially the, what we found is that only a, a small share of the original externality uh, is resolved, uh, and that welfare gains are, uh, are, are quite contained. And the reason is that this tax is going uh, not to affect directly you know, the, 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 the shadow value of nature, uh, but only indirectly through the labor markets. And so, uh, of course, that this tax is going to regenerate a shift from the brown to the green sector, but overall, the, the stock of nature doesn't change much. Uh, I had some details, uh, but I don't think I can access them. Uh, so you have to, to believe me uh, on this one. So yeah, add some figures. Uh, I will conclude, therefore, uh, with a little bit of time uh, still, that what we did is to enrich, uh, we enriched a standard stochastic two-block growth model with natural capital. Uh, alongside with man-made capital, uh, we, show, we, we put natural capital as an input in production uh, in both blocks, but only one block is endowed with it to reflect uh, real-world asymmetries in the use of nature. Uh, and uh, we highlighted how depletion of nature for uh, natural capital for production reduces its ability to, to regenerate itself, like in the real natural world. We traced different uh, efficient dynamics for nature and economic variables by comparing a world still rich in nature and a world in which these assets have been critically depleted. And then we incorporated an externality in the model and derived optimal policy. Of course, our uh, analysis opened the doors for further more rich uh, policy exercises and application, especially uh, given that we are using a time inhomogeneous policy function which allows to account or take into account you know, the, the uncertainty and the future changes in the economic structure that could arise, uh, such as you know, greening the production structure where, where the shares of, of green input might increase through time, or changes in the elasticity of substitutions and so on and so forth. So I think uh, I'm five minutes uh, earlier, uh, but that's uh, not a bad thing, I guess. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and thank you for listening.